Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in you one stone upon another. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The word for visitation that we just heard in the gospel is episkopos, episcopae. This word is the basis for the word episcopal, which you've heard before. We usually translate it, though, as bishop or overseer. You did not know the time of your oversight. The idea is that of a man charged with oversight, like a bishop coming, coming in to check in, maybe check, give a check up to the local congregation. That's exactly what Jesus is doing in his visit to Jerusalem. Specifically, he's fulfilling a prophecy from the Old Testament, echoed in our hymn of the day as well from Zephaniah. The prophecy, though, being from Zechariah 10. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. Again, that's Zechariah 10. As soon as Jesus enters his city, Jerusalem, he visits the house that Solomon de dedicated to him. Well, rather, that was rebuilt and dedicated to him again. This city is meant to be an icon of the eternal city in heaven. That is the dwelling place of God with men, with you. So also the temple itself was meant to be an icon of Christ's body a sign of Jesus' eternal presence with his people. But the image of the city and of the temple as icons of a greater reality of heaven and Christ and his church, that's been obscured. Now they have put their fear, love, and trust in the city itself or in the temple itself. We know that they have misunderstood its purpose because of what Jesus how Jesus interacts with the temple itself. He goes in and he turns over the money changers in the Gentile courts and he restores the temple to its purpose, to hear preaching, to be absolved of sins, and to give life, life eternal. They've so lost sight of that, they've made it what he calls a den of robbers, just as Jeremiah foretold. But both Jerusalem and the temple were always meant to be temporary. David understood that, Solomon understood that, but it seems the people of Jesus' day do not. As icons, they are shadows of the eternal reality. But even as shadows, God's people can desecrate them and to use them grievously. Before bringing his judgment upon the current shepherds in the temple, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and scribes, and doing what must be done, we know that what they've done is grievous because Jesus grieves over them. He weeps over Jerusalem. The only other time we have Jesus weeping in this way is at the death of his dear friend Lazarus. Now Jesus is mourning over the city and ultimate destruction of its temple as he did the death of his friend. He's mourning the death of the faith of his people. Jesus weeps as he foresees the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, again because they have forsaken him and his word. He knew the slaughter that would come upon his people, all because they did not know, as he says, the things that make for peace. To understand Jesus, remember why the Romans came and dismantled Jerusalem in AD 70, not one stone left upon another. Tensions had been mounting in Israel ever since the days that Roman, the Romans had conquered them. And various factions were interpreting God's promises of an eternal kingdom instead 
in an earthly way politically. You've heard this many times. They believed that God's promise to King David that there would be a king that his kingdom would never end, that that would be fulfilled on earth temporally, politically. Even his own disciples were under the same sort of delusion all the way up until the point of his ascension in Acts 1. Judas hoped that Jesus would be a political messiah, and when Jesus says he's not, that's when Judas betrays him unto death. Jesus does not fulfill the expectations of his disciples, or really of his people, and what they wanted from a messiah. He teaches this quite clearly, that his kingdom is not of this world, John 18, and that the kingdom of God is within or among us here in the Christian church, Luke 17. Christ also clearly differentiates between God and Caesar, if you like, or even Satan, granting that Caesar has the sphere of power that Jesus has no plans of supplanting. You can read Paul's exposition on that in Romans 13. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, neither Jerusalem and nor the restoration of the temple either. This is why John Darby's dispensationalism, so popular amongst us in this country, along with the false assertions made in the Rockefeller-funded Schofield Reference Bible, they're ignorant. They are not what God's Word teach. Jesus' own Word explicitly rejects any kind of thousand-year reign on earth, an earthly rule, with a restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. And any of the propaganda that our government and other people have used to justify well, getting your support for a war in the Middle East. The political machinations of the nation and its allies, once home to the temple, they cannot make for peace. Of course, contemporary events have demonstrated this quite well. We're not seeing peace in the Middle East. We're seeing an increase of war. Those people once called by God's name are not making peace. They do not know the things that make for peace, which ultimately is Christ's rule and his return. What, make the, what are the things that make for Israel's peace? To answer this question, we have to understand what brought upon Israel the tyranny and warfare, the frequent exiles, the continual assaults from Egypt and from Assyria and from Babylon and ultimately from, from Greece and Rome. The scriptures assert that all of their oppression and the oppression of Jesus' day by the Roman Empire is a result of their sin and faithlessness. When God establishes his people with the Mosaic Law, he makes this assertion. Leviticus 26 lays down the program of events that will happen to Israel if she fails in her faithfulness to the Lord. It says, Leviticus 26, I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities laid waste. That's what happens when God's people are unfaithful. And indeed, that's exactly what happened to Israel. Its major city and its temple lay desolate, recorded for us in the histories of both the Jews and the Romans. And today, Jesus promises to never restore them again. The return from exile in the temple and its restoration are fulfilled, not in some plot of land on the other side of the world, but now in his kingdom, the church, and in the tabernacle and temple that is his body. Because the promises for Jerusalem and the temple are fulfilled in Jesus and in his church, well, that leads us to answer what then makes for her peace. What makes for your peace? The Lord answers this question as well in Leviticus 26. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, then I will forgive them. In other words, the things that make for peace are the things that you receive every time you gather here. 
in his new Jerusalem in this temple that is his body, the Holy Christian Church. It's the words of repentance and forgiveness of sins that make for peace. As St. Peter proclaimed, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by, indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Again, Peter speaking to you, the Christian church. Therefore, to you who believe in Jesus, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts which, weigh, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Here you hear St. Peter properly teach us our relationship to Zion, Jerusalem, and to the temple, and to our source of mercy, that is, the things that make for peace. And it's in Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone, a rock of stumbling and offense to those who refuse to believe, but for those who believe, the one who brings peace. And that's precisely what Jesus is doing when he came into Jerusalem that holy week. He's coming to be the thing that makes for peace. That is, to bear the sins of his people. He wept because he knew most of his people would not recognize him as their source of forgiveness and peace. Even his own disciples will reject him until he arises. But when he does rise from the dead, what does he do? He comes to his own and he gives them peace. He shows them the wounds and say, peace to you. And then he breathes out his Holy Spirit upon them, giving them the same ministry that is of the Spirit, a ministry of forgiveness of sins, making peace between God and man, the only peace that lasts forever. That means that today is your day of visitation because your shepherd and overseer Jesus has come and yes, weeps over your sins, but makes for your peace. He proclaims to you, I forgive you all your sins. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins as you eat and drink his body and blood. That temple curtain has been torn in two. You have access to God in Christ fully and completely. Not one stone was left upon another in that temple in Jerusalem because now the dwelling place of God with man is for you in Jesus. And you have been joined to him in baptism, you being living stones built up into this new temple. You are forgiven. Go in peace. So may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.